Okay, we're in session 14, and we're going to explore chapters 43 and 44 this evening. And uh, we're also going to encounter one of the most interesting characters in history, a guy by the name of Cyrus the Great. And so our agenda tonight, we'll go through chapter 43, and if we use the parsing of the, as is our, star, uh, our style, we will explore this from the point of view of the International Standard Version, uh, just out, which takes advantage of the proprietary translation of the Dead Sea Scrolls by Dr. Peter Flint. And so the, 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 the ISV parses chapter 43 in a group of, in four sessions, and we'll look, at, we'll look at it that way. We'll look at it in the ISV, and then we'll also do our commentary from the, from the King James Version. So those of you that you get, get a chance to get both flavors, if you would. And then chapter 44 is, is also by the ISV broken down into four segments there. And then we're going, we're going to encounter at the end of chapter 44, it introduces this character by the name of Cyrus the Great. And I think we'll have time to explore the fall of Babylon, some surprising events that occur uh, when Cyrus conquered Babylon and so forth. And so that's our agenda for the evening. Well, let's just jump right in and we'll always start with the... Uh, the ISV's rendering of it, I think uh, we're discovering it really flows. You can really get a sense of the eloquence of Isaiah from uh, this translation. But let's take a look at it. Chapter 43, starting verse 1. But now this is what the Lord says, the one who created you, Jacob, the one who formed you, Israel. Do not be afraid because I've redeemed you. I've called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they won't sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you won't be scorched, and the flame won't set you ablaze. I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Redeemer. And I've given Egypt as your ransom, Cush and the people of Seba in exchange for you. Since you're precious in my sight and honored, and because I love you, I'm giving up people in your place and nations in exchange for your life. Wow, so that's the opening. In, in, uh, uh, in modern English. Let's take a look at the King James. I think it's not that different, but it's a different flavor, perhaps. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle uh, upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia, and Seba for thee. Since thou wast precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Therefore will I give men for thee, and people for thy life. And uh, this whole idea of giving ransom is interesting. In Proverbs 21.18 we read, The wicked shall be a ransom for the righteous, and the transgressor for the upright. So that's what God seems to be applying here. And, of course, this, the term the Savior, as we see it in the King James, that appears six times in Isaiah, the number of new beginnings, incidentally. But, uh, so we'll move on here. Picking up the ISV again, verse 5. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. I'll bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I'll say to the north, give them up. And to the south, don't keep them back. Bring my sons from far away and my daughters from the ends of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Bring out the people who are blind, yet still have eyes, who are deaf, yet still have ears. It's interesting how the ISV flows pretty smoothly here. It continues, let all the nations be gathered together, let the peoples be assembled. Who is there among them who can declare this or announce the former things? Let them produce their witnesses to prove them right, and let them proclaim so people will say it's true. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I've chosen, so that you may know and trust me and understand that I am the one. Before me no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. I, yes, I am the Lord, and apart from me there is no Savior. Wow, so that's a strong language. It doesn't really require comment. This is God speaking very directly and about himself. Wow. He continues, I've revealed and saved and proclaimed when there was no foreign God among you. And you are my witnesses, declares the Lord. I am God. Also from the ancient days, I am the one. And there is no one who can deliver out of my hand. And when I act, who can reverse it? This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. 
For your sake I will send to Babylon, and will bring them down as fugitives. Now as for the Babylonians, their ringing cry will become lamentation. I am the Lord, your Holy One, Creator of Israel, and your King. Very strong, very direct. It lays it right out there. Let's see, in the, in the King James, they're more familiar to most of us probably. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, give up. To the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Bring forth the blind people that have eyes and the deaf that have ears. Let all nations be gathered together and let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us former things? Let them bring forth their witnesses that they may be justified. Or let them hear and say, it is truth. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Wow. It's interesting up there. Ye are my witness, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen. Sounds like a duet up there, doesn't it? Interesting. And as far as I am the Lord, beside me there is no Savior. <clears throat> That's what John tell, Gospel John tells us in 14.6. I am the way, the truth, and life. And, and then uh, uh, also uh, Acts 4.12. There's no other name under heaven given among men by which you are saved. In fact, let's always remember that Jesus there, had his unanswered prayers. Three of them in Gethsemane. He pray, prayed with the Father. If there be any other way, let's take it. Nevertheless, not my will, but mine. But three times. And he didn't do it casually. He sweat blood, according to Dr. Luke. So we need to realize the exclusiveness here. That's not, a, that's, uh, that's, that's not optional. It's very, very clear all the way through here. And that's what, of course, God himself here is, is uh, underscoring as we go through these passages. I have declared and I have saved and I have sh showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Yea, before the day was I am he. And there is none that shall deliver out of my hand. And I will work, and who shall let it? Now, this is one of those places where the King James, is, the word let there means hinder. It's the Old English. A, if you're in the, I love the King James, but there are half, three or four, well, about five or six words that you have to realize have a little different meaning back then. And uh, who shall let it? Who will hinder it? Is what the, the thought is there, actually. And so, okay, moving on. Thus saith the Lord your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I have sent to Babylon, and have brought down all their nobles and their Chaldeans, whose cry is in the ships. I am the Lord your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. It's interesting, this is an allusion to Babylon, which doesn't rise to power for another century. Isaiah is going to talk about Babylon as the bad guys, and that he's going to crush them, but he's telling this, he's putting this all in writing, a hundred years before Babylon rises to power. We miss that unless you're really paying attention. And uh, there's another illusion here that I won't d d get into detail about the Chaldeans whose cry is in the ships, the, the fact that the uh, tribe of Dan joined the Phoenicians and really uh, there's a whole uh, uh, study that makes the tribe of Dan rather distinctive in some unpleasant ways. But I'll leave that for your footnotes and you can dig into that on your own. Let's go back to the, uh, the ISV and pick up the next segment here. Starting verse 16, this is what the Lord says, Who makes a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters? Who brings out chariots and horsemen and armies and warriors at the same time? They lay there, never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a candle. Don't remember the former things, don't dwell on things past. Watch, I'm about to carry out something new. And now it's springing up, don't you recognize it? I am making a way in the wilderness and paths in the desert. Wild animals, jackals, and owls will honor me because I provide water in the desert and streams in the wilderness to give drink to my people, my chosen ones, the people whom I formed for myself, so that they may speak my praise. This leads to a view by many theologians that the animals probably may know more, may know more about God than we give them credit for. Interestingly enough. And so, well, the same passage in the King James reads a little differently, but same essential thought. Thus saith the Lord, which maketh a way in the sea and a path in the mighty waters. Now this, this passage here in uh, verse uh, 16 and an equivalent passage in Psalm 8 verse 8 
convinced a guy by the name of Matthew Fontaine Murray to de dedicate his life to searching for pathways in the sea. What a strange idea. It was in the Bible, so it must be true. So he spent his life focusing on that, and he has acknowledged, I'll come back to that, let me finish this before I move on to the slide here. Which bringeth forth the chariot and horse, the army and the power, and they shall lie down together, and they shall not rise, they are extinct, and they are quenched as tow. And remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. But this path in mighty waters, I could, I could, as a Naval Academy graduate, I remember so vividly marching down Stripling Walk to the academic group. The main hall there is called Maury Hall. After, And so I was quite surprised to realize that he is recognized universally in all countries as the father of oceanography. And uh, he, he really devoted his life to that and is, he's recognized as the pathfinder of the seas or the founder of, of uh, ocean, ocean. he's in the Hall of Fame in uh, 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 in New York, and uh, his, his monument is also in Richmond, Virginia, and so forth. Anyway, let's move on here. Verse 19. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall bring forth, shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The beasts of the field shall honor me, the dragons and owls, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. And there's scholastic debate on which of these Hebrew words really mean which animals, and I'd, we don't have to spend time, whether it's owls or ostriches or whatever. But we'll move on here. This people have I formed for myself, and they shall show forth my praise. Moving to the next segment, verse 22 from the ISV. And yet you didn't call upon me, Jacob. Indeed, you are tired of me, Israel. There again, we see the two words being used. When, when names are changed, they usually stay permanently changed, but there's an exception to that. And Jacob, when his name was changed to Israel, both names will emerge. When he's spiritual, he'll be called Israel. When he's in the flesh, it's Jacob. And you get that flavor all through the scripture. It's interesting. Uh, that way. Anyway, moving on here, verse 23. You haven't brought me your sheep for a burnt offering, nor have you honored me with your sacrifices, nor have you made meal offerings for me, yet I have not tired you about incense. You haven't brought me sweet cane with money, nor have you satisfied me with the fat of your sacrifices. You have only burdened me with your sins and made me tired with your iniquities. <laughs> God's getting tired of that, isn't he? He says, I, I am the one who blots out your transgression for my own sake, and I'll remember your sins no more. Recount the brief. Let's argue the matter together. Present your case so that you may be proved right. Your first ancestor sinned, and your mediators rebelled against me. So I'll disgrace the leaders of the temple, and I'll consign Jacob to total destruction and Israel to contempt. So God is expressing his frustration there. When he speaks of first ancestor, he's probably referring to Abraham, the first Jew, in that sense, in the flavor of the passage. And... Uh, but in the King James, it's pretty much the same thing. But thou hast not called upon me, O Jacob, but thou hast been weary of me, O Israel. See, see, there it is again. Thou hast not brought me the small cattle of thy burnt offerings, neither hast thou honored me with thy sacrifice. I have not caused thee to serve with an offering, nor wearied thee with incense. Thou hast brought me no sweet cane with money, neither hast thou filled me with the fat of thy sacrifices, but thou hast made me serve with thy sins. Thou hast wearied me with thine iniquities. I, even I, he that blotteth out thy transgressions for my own sake and will not remember thy sins. Put me in remembrance. Let us plead together. Declare thou that thou mayest be justified. Thy first father hath sinned, and thy teachers have transgressed against me. Therefore I have profaned the princes of the sanctuary, and have given Jacob to the curse, and Israel to reproaches. So, but now he's going to shift and pronounce a blessing, even though in spite of his frustrations, he's going to, God's going to know. He would shift it to chapter 44, just now, by the way in these two chapters what we're focusing on tonight. Verse 1 of chapter 44, But now listen, Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. This is what the Lord says, the one who made you, formed you from the womb, and who will help you. Don't be afraid, Jacob, my servant, and Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. That's a poetic endearment term. I'll come back to that. For I'll pour water upon this thirsty ground and streams on parched land, so I, will I pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing upon your descendants. They'll spring up as among the green grass, like willows by flowing streams. One will say, I belong to the Lord. Another will call himself by the name of Jacob. Still another will have written on his hand, the Lord's, and will adopt the name of Israel. Well, the, the King James is uh, pretty much the same, and I think I've talked about the Jacob-Israel thing before, but just reminding you about that. 
Yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant in Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus saith the Lord that made thee and formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou, Jeshurun, uh, whom I have chosen. And the word, the, the Jacob, my servant, Israel thing I mentioned before, and the Jeshurun is a, like a poetical name uh, for Israel. And, and it's used in Deuteronomy 32 and 33 and a couple of other places. It mean, the word actually means the upright ones, but just a term of endearment. For I will pour water upon he that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thy offspring. And they shall spring up as among the grass, as well as up by the water courses. One shall say, I am the Lord's. Another shall call himself by the name of Jacob. Another shall subscribe with his hand unto the Lord and his surname himself with the name of Israel. The, uh, there, this, in these passages, there hasn't been any profound differences in my reckoning between the ISV or the King James. I think the ISV flows more comfortably, more smoothly. And because it does, I think we, we, we sense um, uh, uh, Isaiah's heart more. Um, I still um, um, am committed to the, uh, the King James as a, as a base text for a lot of reasons. The majesty is hard to, hard to uh, uh, let go of, and, uh, but it is, it, is, it is more formal and a little, it doesn't have the smoothness of the ISV. Well, let's pick it up at verse 6. This is what the Lord says, the King of Israel and its Redeemer, the Lord of the heavenly armies is his name. I am the first and I am the last, and apart from me there is no God. See, God is really hammering this because he's going to really do, deal with the polemic against idolatry. And that's going to climax in chapter 46, we'll see later. So he's really asserting himself. It's, it's very interesting that you don't see that in the Bible so much. You usually have an apostle or a prophet talking about God. Here God is declaring himself, uh, and uh, hitting it pretty hard. I'm the first, I'm the last, and apart from me there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it and declare it, and lay it out for himself. Since he made an ancient people, let him speak future events. Let them tell him what will happen. A little sarcasm here, and so forth. Don't tremble, don't be afraid. Didn't I tell you and announce it long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? There is no other rock. I don't know of any. And the King James handles it pretty much the same way. Thus saith the Lord God, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last. Beside me there is no God. It's pretty straightforward. And who as I shall call and shall declare it and set it in order for me since I appointed the ancient people? And the things that are coming and shall come, let them show unto them. Now, this I am the first and the last. At the, in the last session previously, uh, back in chapter 41, I, I gave you a list of those references. And it's an interesting series of references to go through. I listed them on the bottom of your slide, so they're in your notes. But uh, if you go to those one at a time with someone like that has, that has a problem with the deity of Jesus Christ. It's interesting because each one makes, is clearly talking about the people that the Jehovah's Witness would call Jehovah God. And uh, each one, and if you take it in that order, you get to the New Testament, same thing, Revelation 1, 11, 17, 22. Uh, I am the first and the last. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. Then you end with the last one at Revelation 2, 8. I am the first and the last who was dead and now alive forevermore, which is clearly a, from, the, from, the, from the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's a very, very interesting affirmation of Jesus as a member of the Trinity that is uh, uh, controversial to some, but it's very clear in the text. So that's a little stream that we may find useful if you're being challenged in that kind of an area. Continuing, fear ye not, neither be afraid. Haven't I told thee from that time and, ye, and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. Now, now it shifts right focus from that to a re rebuke of idol worship. In the ISV, starting at verse 9, Now all the forming of images means nothing, and the things they treasure are worthless. Their own witnesses cannot see. They know nothing. So they will be put to shame. Who would shape a God or cast an image that profits nothing? To be sure, all who associate with it will be put to shame. And as for the craftsmen, they are only human. Let them all gather together and take their stand. Let them be terrified, and they will be humiliated together. The blacksmith prepares a tool and works in the coals, and then fashions an idol with hammers, working by the strength of his arm. 
He even becomes hungry and loses his strength. He drinks no water and grows faint. In other words, the idol doesn't supply anything he needs. <laughs> the carpenter measures it with a line. He traces its shape with a stylus, then fashions it with planes and shapes it with a compass. He makes the idol like a human figure with a human bo a beauty to be at home in a shrine. He cuts down cedars or chooses a cypress tree or an oak, lets it grow strong among the trees of the forest, or he plants a cedar and the rain makes it grow. He divides it up for the people to burn, taking part of it he warms himself, makes a fire, bakes bread. Or perhaps he constructs a god and worships it. He makes an idol and bows down to it. Half the wood he burns in the fire, and over that half he places meat so he can eat. He eats by its coals, warms himself, and says, Ah, I am warm in front of the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god. Two blocks of wood he bows down, worships, prays, and says, Save me since you are my god. Do you see how the, the, the parody or the sarcasm, it's, it's, it's interesting to see that come through. They don't realize, they don't understand because their eyes are plastered over so they cannot see, and their minds too so they cannot understand. No one stops to think, no one has the knowledge or understanding to think, yes to think. Half of it I burn in the fire, and I even bake bread on its coals, and I roasted meat and ate it, and, and am I about to make detestable things from what is left? Am I ab about to bow down to blocks of wood? He tends ashes. A deceived mind has led him astray. It cannot be his life, nor can he say, there is a lie in my right hand. <laughs> well, the King James, the same, the same words, but doesn't quite have the flow. Let's see what it says here. They that make a graven image are all of them vanity, and their de delectable things shall not profit. And they are their own witnesses. They see not, nor know they can, uh, that they may be ashamed. Who hath formed a god, or a molten, a graven image that is profitable for nothing? Behold, all his fellows shall be ashamed, and the workmen, all they are of men. Let them all be gathered together, let them stand up, yet they shall fear, and they shall be ashamed together. The smith with the tongs both worketh in the coals, and fashioneth with hammers, and worketh it with the strength of his arms. Yea, he is hungry, and his strength faileth. He drinketh no water, and is faint. The carpenter stretches out his rule, marketh it out with a line, fitteth it with planes, and marketh it with his compass, and maketh it after the figure of the man according to the beauty of a man, that it may remain in the house. <laughs> he heweth him down cedars, taketh a cypress and an oak, which he strengthened for himself among the trees of the forest. He planteth an ash, and the rain shall nourish it. Then shall it be for a man to burn, for he will take thereof and warm himself. Yea, he kindleth it, and baketh bread. Yea, he maketh a god, and worshipeth it. He maketh it a graven image, and falleth down thereto. He burneth part thereof in the fire. With part thereof he eateth flesh, he, he roasteth the roast, and is satisfied. Yea, he warmeth himself, and saith, Aha, I am warm, I have seen the fire. And the residue thereof he maketh a god, even his graven image. He falls down to it, he worships it, prays to it, and says, Deliver me, for thou art my god. They have not known or understood, they have shut their eyes that they cannot see, their hearts that they cannot understand. And none consider in his heart, neither is there knowledge or understanding to say, I have burned part of it in the fire, yea, also I have baked bread upon the coals thereof, I have roasted flesh and eaten it. And shall I make the residue thereof an abomination? Shall I fall down to the stock of a tree? He feedeth on ashes, he, dece he deceiveth heart, hath turned him aside, that he cannot deliver his soul, nor say, is there not a lie in my right hand? And... Uh, this is a contrast to the Good Shepherd and so forth, other passages, but no, I won't go down there here. So here's the wrap up for chapter 44, but there's a little surprise at the end, so let's take a look at it here. In the ISV, remember these things, Jacob, Israel, for you are my servant. I have formed you. You are a servant to me. Israel, you must not mislead me. I've wiped away your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like mist. Return to me because I've redeemed you. Shout for joy, you heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout aloud, you depths of the earth. Burst out with singing, you mountains, you forest, and all your trees. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and will display his glory in Israel. This is what the Lord says. Your Redeemer and the one who formed you in the womb, I am the Lord who has made everything, who alone stretches out the heavens and spread, and spread out the earth, 
Who was with me at that time? Who frustrates the omens of idle talkers and drives diviners mad? Who turns back the wise and makes their knowledge foolish? Who carries out the words of his servants and fulfills the predictions of his messengers? Who says of Jerusalem, I will be inhabited, and of Judah's cities, they will be rebuilt, and of her ruins, I will raise them up? Who says of the watery deep, be dry, I will dry up your rivers? And here's the last verse, which really belongs to the next chapter. Notice what it says, verse 28. Who says about Cyrus, he's my shepherd, and he'll carry out everything I please. He'll say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt, and of my temple, let its foundations I get laid again. What's strange here is Isaiah is talking about the rebuilding of Jerusalem, which will be destroyed by Babylon, but Babylon itself hasn't even risen to power yet. This prophecy is so much in advance that, that uh, causes some confusion among some scholars. But Cyrus is the one that's going to um, uh, free Israel from the captivity of Babylon, which hasn't happened yet. Babylon is yet to rise to power and become God's instrument in putting them into captivity for 70 years. And when Cyrus takes over Babylon, he frees them. So this is all lay, being laid out in advance two centuries before the fact. And that, well, that's why th this is so well documented, that's why it's so powerful, and we're going to go right through that. But I want you to know, Cyrus, this, the, the last couple of verses here really are the flavor of the next chapter. And so let's look at it in the uh, King James. Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, thou art my servant, I have formed thee, thou art my servant. O Israel, thou hast not forgotten of me. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord hath done it. Shout, ye lower parts of the earth, break forth into singing, ye mountains, O forest, and every tree therein. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob, and glorified himself in Israel. Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself that frustrateth the, th the tokens of the liars, and makes the diviners mad, that turneth the wise men backwards, and make their knowledge foolish. And uh, that's an echo, really, of 1 Corinthians 1, 20 and following. Remember the foolishness of God. That's a very interesting passage. That confirmed the word of his servant, that performed the counsel of his messengers, that saith to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be inhabited, and to the cities of Judah ye shall be built, and I will raise up the decayed places thereof. And saith to the deep, Be dry, and I will dry up thy rivers, that saith of Cyrus, now this, by the way, is 150 years before he was born, by the way, but let's go on, that saith for Cyrus, he is my shepherd, shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. That summarizes his career, that the, the river's going to be dried up, and he's, gonna, he's going to... Uh, take over, and he's going to free them to go back and build their temple and their foundations. That's a big, this is a, a, a f fantastic, uh, written about 300 years before his birth. And uh, uh, Daniel 11 event is also about 300 years before those events. And uh, see, when Isaiah wrote this, Jerusalem had not yet been destroyed, and yet he notes here it's going to be rebuilt, and, uh, and, and so forth. So. So Cyrus, let's talk a little bit about Cyrus the Great, because we're going to talk a lot about him in the next session. He's more than just a great man that found an empire, from the Aegean Sea all the way to the Indus River. He is seen by many as the epitome of a great leader. Not just a great leader, the epitome of a great leader. He was very brave, very daring. He was very tolerant and very magnanimous. He's got an incredible history here. And... Uh, some even go so far as to suggest from the way God talks about him that he's almost, in a sense, a type of Christ, because he's a king of kings. And uh, that may be going a little bit far, but I alert you to the possibility that some scholars that dwell on that. And uh, now he established what's known as the Medo-Persian Empire. And uh, his, his father, Cambyses, was the king of Anshan, that's eastern Elam. His mother was Mandane, the daughter of Astyas, the, the, the king of Media. And uh, he, in 550, he, he attacks his father-in-law, the corrupt Stagis. He captured Ekatabana uh, without a battle. 
that becomes his pattern. He's so powerful, he captures these places without a battle. And that's what happened there, and the important thing, that's also what happens in Babylon. Most people don't realize that. He welded the Medes and the Persians into a unified nation that continued for 200 years. Think about that. And we know it as the Persian Empire, but the biblical perspective is the Medo Persian Empire because it's actually a combination of those two, those two ethnic things. But at this point, I want to shift and we give you a refresher, a quick refresher on the fifth chapter of Daniel. And for reasons that'll be clear, I, what I usually do for some a number of personal reasons, I usually preface this little story by an anecdote about Lord Nelson. Lord Nelson, the famous British admiral, the uh, midshipman yelled, Lord Nelson, Lord Nelson, there is a French frigate off the starboard bow. Lord Nelson says, get me my red, get me my red waistcoat and sound general quarters which they do, and they sink the frigate. A few days later, the midshipman comes in, Lord Nelson, Lord Nelson, there's another French warship on the port quarter. It says, sound general quarters and get me my red waistcoat. Gets down his red waistcoat. They engage the French ship and sink it. The midshipman comes to Lord Nelson and says, Lord Nelson, sir, request permission to ask a question. He says, granted, son, that's the way you learn. He said, I notice every time we go into battle, you always ask for your, re your red waistcoat. Uh, why is that, sir? Good you ask, son. I always wear that so in case I should sustain a hit, I don't want the, the, tr the, uh, the crew distracted by the sight of blood. Oh, I get it. I get it pretty good. A few days later, the midshipman comes in again and says, Lord Nelson, Lord Nelson, the entire French fleet is on the horizon. He says, sound general quarters and get me my brown britches. <laughs> now, silly little story but it'll have some utility here in a moment. Let's go on here. The fall of Babylon in Daniel chapter 5. And uh, let's move into this. Nebuchadnezzar, you all remember from Daniel, he was, a, he was a fabulous king. He wrote one of the chapters in the book of Daniel, chapter 4 in fact. Nebuchadnezzar was a very interesting guy. I personally suspect when I'm in heaven we'll meet him there. I think I wouldn't be a bit surprised if he's saved. But in any case, he has successors. And I won't go through them all here. One ruled for two years, then there were coups, and then another. They all, there's just a whole uh, uh, series of them that succeeded. You finally get down to this guy, Nabonidus, who was not a winner. Uh, he didn't really like being in charge. He was frequently absent, and he really uh, only lasted for nine months. And there was another coup to put Nabonidus to the throne. And he spent all his time in North Arabia. He didn't pay attention to his... Uh, he really was technically in charge, but not practically in charge. Belshazzar was in charge. His son, Belshazzar, was the co-regent. What's interesting about that, history books for many, many, many years uh, didn't know anything about Nabonidus, or didn't know anything about Belshazzar. They, they thought there was an error in the Bible. And it's a more recent discoveries that clarified that, that, Nab that uh, Belshazzar was the co-regent, and he actually was in charge the night that, that uh, uh, Babylon fell. In fact, the documents that are uncovered is clear they were done by eyewitnesses. So there's a lot, not a lot known about the fall of Babylon today that wasn't known uh, you know, decades ago. But anyway, his defection is part of the story. He led, he led his army to northern Arabia, dissatisfaction by the people of uh, Babylon. Even the priests of Marduk, the national deed of Babylon, became alienated from him. So he's a loser. So all this gives Cyrus the, a pretext for invading the lowlands. So let's take a look at Daniel chapter 5, verse 1. Belshazzar the king, he should have been defending. So he, instead of making a defense, he made a great feast to a thousand of his lords. That's a lot of people, a thousand of his lords. And drank wine before the thousand. And Belshazzar, uh, went, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the gold and silver vessels, which his father, great-grandfather actually, Bel and Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem. So they went across the street where the museum was, those silver things that were taken in the fall of of Jerusalem, and they used them for party vessels. They took, out, they took them out of the temple, which is in Jerusalem, and the king and his princes and his wives and his concubines, that they might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple to the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, and the king and the princes and his wives and concubines drank in them. This is desecrating them, obviously. They drank wine, praised the gods of gold and of silver and of brass and of iron and of wood and of stone. Now, Babylon was double-walled, very considered impregnable by then, about 15 miles square, 350 foot 
wall, 87 feet wide. They raced six chariots abreast on top of that wall. It was an incredible place. Zeroing in the thing proper, just to give you a picture of it here, the, um, they had a second wall, a second moat, 250 watchtowers, about 100 feet above the wall. And uh, the banquet wall, by the way, that they did all this in has been excavated. It's about 56 feet by 173 feet. And uh, it's going to have a prophetic destiny at the end of the age, by the way. But let's move on here. The Tower of Babel, this is all the part. This is just a little background from Daniel 5, you remember, if you remember that study. But I want you to notice verse 5 and 6 here. In the same hour, this big party is going on, a thousand people, get the picture. In the same hour forth, came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over and against the candlestick upon the, or lampstand, upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Do you think he was terrified? Absolutely. Most of the next verse. Then the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him. <laughs> and this is one of those places you can't improve on the, on the King James. I love the next one. So that the joints of his loins were loosed, and his knees smote one against the other. <laughs> That's graphic, isn't it? But see, even here in polite society, you might miss the point. So let me just suggest that Belshazzar needed his brown britches. See, if I use the term loins loosed, what does that mean? It's a little academic. No, you have, to under, you have to get the picture because this is going to be important in history. Just trust me. You're probably wondering, what am I bringing that in here for? Watch this very carefully. Remember Daniel 5, verse 6. And the joints of his loins were loosed. Okay. The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers. The king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Notice the third, see? Because even Belshazzar was second because his dad was co-regent but absent, see? Then came in all the king's wise men and they could not read the writing nor make known to the king the interpretation thereof. Oh boy. So I'm going to introduce you to the first cryptography. As you know, cryptolo cryptology is one of our backgrounds. That's, we've, written a, we've written a text on that. So we're going to interpret the handwriting on the wall here. Then was King Belshazzar greatly troubled. His accountants was changed in him. His lords were astonished. Now the queen, by, in other words, she's the grandmother, the queen, by reason of words of the king and his lords, came into the banquet house. She apparently wasn't part of the party. That's interesting. And the queen spake and said, O king, live forever. Let not thy tr thoughts trouble thee, nor let thy countenance be changed. There is a man in the kingdom, there is a man in thy kingdom, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of thy father, light, understanding, and wisdom, and, and like the wisdom of the gods was found in him, whom the king Nebuchadnezzar, now that's his great grandfather, whatever, uh, thy father the king, I say, thy father made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. For as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding and interpreting of dreams and showing of hard sentences and dissolving of doubts were found in the same Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Notice she uses his Jewish name, but also adds the, the uh, Babylonian name they had given him. Now let Daniel be called and he will show the interpretation. Then was Daniel brought in before the king, out of retirement, so to speak. And the king spake and said unto Daniel, Art thou that Daniel? which are to the children of the captivity of Judah, whom the king, who the king my father brought out of Jewry. When it says my father, realized realize didn't have grandparents, great grand, it's, it's, it's several generations back, but anyway. I have even heard of thee that thy spirit of God is in thee, and that the light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee. And now the wise men astrologers have been brought in before me, that they should read this writing and make known to me the interpretation, but they could not show the interpretation of the thing. And I've heard of thee that thou canst make interpretations dissolve doubts. Now, if thou canst read the writing and make known to me the interpretation thereof, thou shalt be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about thy neck, and shalt be the third ruler in the kingdom. And I love Daniel. Daniel is just cool. He did this great in chapter 2, you may recall. Here again. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let thy gifts be to thyself. <laughs> Give thy rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing unto the king, and make known unto him the interpretation. O thou king, the most high God, gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom, and majesty, and glory, and honor. What he's going to say is, now you're dad, now there was a guy, he, he, he was cool. <laughs> Not like you, jerk. <laughs> That's sort of the flavor of it. O thou king, thou most God, gave Nebuchadnezzar a father, a kingdom, majesty, glory, and honor. 
And for majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he slew. Whom he would, he kept alive. And whom he would, he set up. And whom he would, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne and took his glory from him. And they took his glory from him. And this is a, this is summarizing chapter 4 of Daniel here. And he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild asses, and they fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with dew of the heaven, till he knew that the Most High God ruled the kingdom of men, and that he appointed over it whomsoever he will. And thou his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this, but hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before thee, and thou and thy lords and thy wives and thy concubines have drunk wine from them, and thou hast braised the gods of silver, gold, and brass, and iron, and wood, and stone, who would see not, nor hear, nor know, and the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified. Then was the part of the hand sent from him, and this writing was written. And this is the writing that was written. Many, many tekel upharsin. And this is the interpretation of the thing. Many, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Perez, thy king is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Now this is in the Talmud what they, they believe was written on the wall that they couldn't interpret. They think it was just written vertically and backwards. There's another view among the scholars, and that is that this was encrypted. There, is two, there are two basic forms of Hebrew uh, transposition. One's called Alban, where they take the Hebrew alphabet, fold it on itself, and uh, create the transpositions. In other words, they take the, take the letter and take the opposite, and, and you do a transposition. That's a very simple one called Alban, where you do it this way. If you take the, do the same thing, but fold it back under it, it's a different uh, transposition called Atbash. Just leave the, pronouncing the, the beginning and end of the thing. And uh, there is a rabbinical scholarship that believes this was Atbash on the wall. Most of the cryptic, cryptography sciences came out of the, uh, the uh, uh, Hebrew sages that were on the, on the king's um, staff throughout Europe. There's a whole history here. But anyway, so this is probably, if, if that's true, this is what was on the wall. And by transposing it according to the Atbash transcription, and there is examples of that in Isaiah chapter 7 and, I, and Jeremiah 51 and other places. But anyway, so they, if by, in this case, many, many means numbered or reckoned. God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Your number is up, is the way we would say it. And the next one was uh, tekel, which means thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. And the last word is perez, if you put the, imply those vowels, which means broken or divided. But if you re... re uh, point that with different vowels, it's the name Persians. And so it, it, it mentions, but it's a double, it's, it's a pun in effect. Because paras is also the word for the Persians, by implying. Now people get confused because the Eupharsin is in your King James. The U is Aramaic for an and, and Farsin is simply the plural of Perez. So don't let that throw you if you're going through that carefully. Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet, and put a chain of gold upon his necks, and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. However, in that night was Belshazzar, the king of Chaldeans, slain. And Darius, the Median, took the kingdom, being about threescore and two years old. Now, so this is the conquest of Babylon. What you need to understand is very important for you won't understand the future unless you realize Babylon was conquered without a battle. What really happened here? On October 12th of 539 B.C., Cyrus's general captured Babylon without a battle. They were able to cut off the Euphrates River, which lowered the defenses, they slipped in under the wall, took it over. Their people that were there for three days didn't realize it had been taken. There was no battle, they just took it over. The Persians diverted the river Euphrates into a canal upriver so that the water level dropped to the height of the middle of a man's thigh, which thus rendered the flood defenses useless and enabled the invaders to march through the riverbed to enter by night. And that's all recorded by Herodotus, which is known as the father of history. And so, he was contemporary to all this. Now what's interesting, this is the part that just blows me away. About ten days after they took over Babylon, Cyrus makes his grand entry. 
when Cyrus makes his grand entrance, he is greeted by Daniel, who presents him with an ancient scroll of Isaiah, which contained a personal letter that was written 150 years before Cyrus was born, addressing him by name. And so, see, uh, Cyrus was able to boast that the conquest was almost bloodless, with no significant damage to the city. And Daniel lived till about the third year of Cyrus, by the way, presented Cyrus with the writings. And this is all in Josephus, by the way, if you want to check this all out. And uh, so, now, so let's take a look at what Cyrus is, visualize Cyrus, he's reading this ancient scroll of Isaiah, which reads as follows, starting at the end of 44 and into 45. God says, saith to the deep, be dry and I will dry up thy rivers. Well, that's interesting. That saith of Cyrus, oh, can you visualize him reading this? He's called by name here. He is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built. And to the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. It's predicting what he's going to do. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed. What a strange thing to use of a, of a pagan general. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him. And I will loose the loins of kings. You've got to be kidding. There it is. There it is. I will loose... The event of Belshazzar wasn't just a private observation. That obviously was a public embarrassment. That's a matter of history. That Cyrus, he would see the connection. It's a, it was a fulfillment of a prophecy written by Isaiah centuries before. I will lose the Lord the king to open for him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. That's what they did. They slipped under. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I'll break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. I will give thee, listen to what God is saying to Cyrus. I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, mine elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. He's calling him by name in this letter. I mean, that's staggering. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. Can you imagine? Now, what do you think Cyrus would do? Shrug that off? Well, that's kind of interesting. No, he was obviously profoundly impressed. He freed the captives. When he conquered Babylon, he, had, he discovered he had captives called Jews. He freed them. He returned the vessels that had been plundered from the temple 70 years earlier. He even gave them financial support to go back and build their temple in Jerusalem. He gave them the incentive to return to their homeland and rebuild their temple. That's all in 2 Chronicles 36 and the first four verses of the book of Ezra. deals with all of that. It's a matter of history. Okay? Now, uh, uh, so they, only about 50,000 of the Jews take advantage of that offer. So a lot of the others stayed, but uh, 50,000 responded to this royal proclamation, and they returned to Jerusalem under the leadership of Zerubbabel, and that's what the book of Ezra and Nehemiah deal with. Now, you say, this is all interesting. This has been well documented, because if you go to the London Museum, the British Museum in London, I should say, you will find, this is a replica, not the original, relax, I haven't stolen it, but this is a replica of the, what's known as the Cylinder of Cyrus. It was discovered by Hormuz Rassam in the 19th century, and it's presently on display in London. You can go there and visit, and uh, this replica here will be on display here in the briefing room and at, uh, at the River Lodge in Reparoa, but it's just a replica, obviously, uh, as, a, a gift, uh, as a gift to me from a good friend. And uh, so, now, what Cyrus says on this uh, uh, monument, so to speak, is that without any battle he entered the town, sparing any calamity. I returned the sacred cities to the other side of the Tigris, the sanctuaries which had been in ruins for a long time, and established for them permanent sanctuaries. I gathered all their former inhabitants and returned them to their habitations. This documents by Cyrus himself exactly what I'll show you is in Ezra, as a summary of all what he did as a result of this. In Ezra chapter 1, it's recorded in your Bible. 
Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, quote, The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and hath charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God, which is in Jerusalem. Cyrus' own words. Will he be in heaven when I get there? It wouldn't surprise me. I'm not saying he would. I, can't, I obviously don't know. God knows. But it wouldn't surprise me at all. This guy is pretty cool. This guy is pretty cool. So this is just the beginning, because chapter 45 will give us more detail about this incredible character called Cyrus. But it also is going to have some interesting, there will be some interesting textual discoveries that we'll talk about that are very controversial, but we'll get into next time. So what I want you to do for the next session is I want you to study carefully chapter 45, recognizing the last two verses of 44 that we've just dealt with is really part of that chapter. And I also am going to challenge you to find out what you can from your own resources about the career and background of Cyrus the Great and the rise of the Persian Empire. You'll discover that in its early years it was very favorable to Israel. Many of the top positions were given to Jews. It's very interesting to know that was its history. It's very ironic that today Iran is an adversary, but that's not because they're, they're Persian, that's because they're Muslim. It's the Muslim influence that has driven them to this cult of death and all of that. But the history of Persia is very pro-Israel. But what, there's going to be some textual reasons that we're going to explore the possibility. It's a very speculative, controversial point of view, but I want to share it with you. Is it possible that there's a gap between the first two verses in the Bible? Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Period. Second verse may read, but the earth became without form and void, and darkness is on the face of the deep. A transitive verb requiring an object, a connector that's adversative. We'll talk about that. Since about 1814, Thomas Chalmers, I think, from then on, has suggested the possibility that there may have been an interval between those two verses that may explain, so it may solve a lot of problems. We'll explore that next time. And, uh, but I want you to, if you have any background that you want to explore that, because we will deal with that next time as we jump into uh, chapter 45 of Isaiah. So with that, let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer.